So, uh, uh, last time we got together, was everybody here last time? No. No? No. no. Some people weren't. So last time we got together, I think I talked mostly about the spirit, of, the history of the, yeah. of the place, right? And we have it recorded. And the background. And you have it recorded? Yes, and of, the new people, like, as they come what in. What we're trying to do here. We'll get it. I thought I might also mention that I just finished writing um, a review of a book by a woman named Tering Oser, Are you who is a uh, half me, or a Chinese is it, is that uh, father. Him? Nope. It's good. It's good. Well, I should have brought a beautiful little black book. A uh, book by a Chinese father and a Tibetan mother, woman, who lives in Beijing, married to a Chinese guy, Wang Li Xiong, his name, who has. Uh, uh, He's been jailed a couple of times, so has she. He's been very helpful with the Uyghur people in Xinjiang, who suffer a lot in northern Tibet, in that area that used to be called East Turkestan. And of course, she's uh, very identifies with the Tibetan people, who are really in a bad state, being really crushed down by the Chinese communists. And uh, although a lot of Chinese really like the Tibetans, and there are even some Communist Party officials sneak over and go to study with some Lama <laughs> and then hide that from their colleagues. And, uh, but the, <coughs> there, there's still some sort of hardline people from the um, Chinese government who insist on trying to replace the Tibetans. Now, they want to have the land of Tibet. They don't want to have any Tibetans because they know very well that the Tibet was always a separate country, actually. And, um, they don't. They claim that they was, it's always belonged to China, but that's a total lie, and they know that. So they just don't want any Tibetans someday to come and say, "Gee whiz, you know, it's really our country. You, know? you guys can't even live." And the average altitude of Tibet is fourteen thousand feet plus, a little more than Bolivia, and you can't live there if you uh, if you grew up at sea level without getting sick. And uh, women miscarry, and they can't uh, carry babies there properly with the, because of the oxygen. Only 47% of the oxygen. So it's one of the, and it's huge. It's as big as the, Louis, bigger than the Louisiana Purchase. It's as big as the U.S. west of the Mississippi, including the parts, the Arizona, California, you know, stolen from the Mexicans later. <laughs> After the Louisiana was purchased, was bought from Napoleon. Which is just the northern part of that. So it's a huge place, had very few people because it doesn't support a huge population. So now uh, it's reached a state where over 150 Tibetans since about 206 have burned themselves alive or burned their bodies alive in an offering uh, to, without hurting anybody else. You know, it's, it's like a suicide bomber with no victim other than yourself. And uh, in the Tibetan language, actually, they don't say burning yourself or self-immolation, which we call it in English, because they don't consider that's their self. That's just their body, and they give up their body, and it's a, it has a history. I don't want to waste too much time on it. I just want to say that it put me in a mood reading her wonderful book. And Ai Weiwei, who was that famous Chinese artist, you know, who built the bird's nest for the Olympics, but also is a very against the Communist Party, and he's been jailed too, and false texts, you know, all kinds of fake things. But he's still free, and he still speaks up, because he's such an international figure. And he said that the Tibet is the greatest test for China and the rest of the world as to whether they really care at all about human rights, justice, you know, whatever, you know, reality, you know. And uh, so far, and it's a test that you cannot dodge and you cannot get around it, he said. And so far, the results are shameful and disgraceful. <laughs> he wrote this little thing, you know, that he said. Hi, wait, wait. So in that context, you know, Tibet House was formed by the Dalai Lama, starting with one in New Delhi, and then second was ours. And then there's a few others around the world now, which don't have a political role in the sense that, although individually, people like me, like on March 10th, day after tomorrow, I'll be giving a speech in front of the UN at a demonstration about how the Tibetan people exist and how they're suffering genocide and how everybody, because they want money from China or they're making their 
you know, what do you call it? They're making their Apple computers in China. You know, they, they don't want to say anything about it. You know? So they're in a way colluding, they're turning, their, turning away from this, what's happening. And I'll be giving a political type speech like that. Why yeah. March 10th? What? Just to, for everybody. Oh, on March 10th, it, well, because the Dalai Lama, when the Chinese invaded in 1950, and then imposed a fake treaty in 51, called Liberating Tibet from the five Western people who were in Tibet, eight. who were helping around eight. with radios and movie cameras and things, but then yeah. that one, you know, supposedly liberating it from the imperialists, as they said. Uh, then the Dalai Lama at first was counseled to flee by the so he could be a spokesperson for Tibet outside. And you know, communists don't like religion, and he's supposed to be a religious leader and so on. So, but then he decided to go back and try to deal with them. And he even went to Beijing and tried to deal with Mao. He kind of liked the idealistic idea of socialism, sharing wealth and you know, not living for money, as he put it, as he has put it many times on Park Avenue, actually, like life should not be about money. Money is to make life do, uh, livable for people, modest amount of money, but life shouldn't be for money, that's, that's wrong. And so he got del deluded a little bit by Mao, just thinking that they were true idealists and so on. Maybe they had a little shred of idealism at the beginning, maybe not. But they sure have turned into a big dictatorship since then. And um, so he tried to get along with them for n almost nine years. And then what happened was they were just torturing Tibetans, Tibetans were fighting back, it was getting really bad. And at one point it seemed like the general in charge of the Chinese military that had taken over Lhasa in 1959 was going to kill the Dalai Lama. They actually did shell the house where they thought he was living. But before that they tried to invite him without his bodyguards or, his, or any protection to some fake dance troupe. And they had already been assassinating leaders in eastern Tibet by that kind of a ruse, you know, inviting them to a party. Sort of like the white Euro-Americans did to the native people here 100 years or 150 years earlier, or 300 years earlier. So uh, at that time, the people gathered around where the Dalai Lama lived. They wouldn't let him go to that invitation. He was going to accept it anyway. They wouldn't let him. And then Chinese started shelling, and then he was able to escape. And then the people tried to rebel against the Chinese military, just with very few weapons, and you know, very, and they got wasted. Eighty-seven thousand were massacred in 1959, and that began on March 10th. That's why March 10th has been celebrated ever since then in the Tibetan exile community and in Tibet, although they can't do it openly in Tibet, as um, Freedom Day, you know, Uprising Day they call it, you know. and um, you know when they tried to throw off the Chinese military occupation. And the UN made the thing that uh, the China did not have any right, etc. But Tibet was sold out when, when they went to the UN, and when the Chinese first invaded, the uh, uh, Taiwanese, which was in the UN as China at the time, right, which was the Kuomintang, only on Taiwan, right? They'd been kicked out by the communists two years earlier. And so the Taiwanese said, oh yeah, we do own Tibet, <laughs> the Taiwanese. And then the British and the UN, so the British ambassador, on the first day when the appeal came, he said, yeah, they don't own Tibet, what is this? You know, they shouldn't be taking, going in and sending an army into Tibet. Because the British knew very well they'd been involved for a century by then, or more than, yeah, a century in Tibet, almost a century. And they knew perfectly well, the Indians knew perfectly well, they had an embassy in Tibet they inherited from the British, because they had their freedom from the British two years earlier than the Chinese, 47 and 49. And, um, but then the next day the British go, oh no, I've been informed by White House, I shouldn't have said that, it's not really clear, nobody knows, maybe it is Chinese internal affairs, like who knows, because you know, they were thinking of Hong Kong and doing business with China, you know, the whole sellout thing that everyone has done with Tibet because, oh, we're going to get something so much from China, you know, which everybody think, has been thinking, and um, except Donald Trump, luckily. <laughs> He's finally publicly talking about, what is this, a $500 billion a year trade deficit? Has that been helpful to us for the last 20 years, really? Do you think so? You know, Trump says, you know, even though he makes his crap in China too, you know, whatever businesses he has. Anyway, uh, one good thing about Donald Trump, only one of the few. So, uh, so, so the thing is that, uh, so in, anyway, in that all that context, it's so always explained that March 10th, so in that context, the, preserving the culture is like Tibet House's mission, and it's a very crucial thing. 
uh, for the Dalai Lama because he feels he feels this this will pass, and really the saving grace of Tibet. You know, the Chinese have totally swallowed Inner Mongolia and have swamped the seventy five million to two million Inner Mongolians, which really is Mongolia, not Inner Mongolia. It's Mongolia. Anyway, that part that's still owned by China. Uh, from the world post World War II has been completely swamped with Chinese settlers, 75 to 2 million. The Manchu Manchuria, which was originally the country of the Manchus, who were considered foreigners when they conquered China, the Chinese kicked them out in 1911. Anyway, there is something like 90 million Chinese to unknown number of Manchus, because they were the enemy originally, so they kind of hid there who they were. And the Xinjiang Uyghur is about, I think about 30 million Chinese to eight million, eight, ten million Uyghurs, and in Tibet there's 12 million Chinese to six million Tibetans. But they can't, they're only on the edge, the Chinese, the mass of the Chinese, below 10,000 on the river valleys in, on the east, because they can't live regularly, they can go short term to do business and things, but they can't live regularly at the altitude or they get sick. Which is why there weren't millions and millions of Chinese people many centuries before, you know, since they always had a lot more people. But in Tibet is this really sparse place. You have to be a nomad. You have to be able to herd yaks. You have to have a certain kind of nitric oxide in your blood system to, to spread the 47% of the oxygen around to your extremities and so forth, and to uh, get to the placenta in a womb to bear a child. So it's, very, it's a special adaptation. Even the Bolivians don't have that adaptation. The Bolivians, because I think they have coca, they have a herb. They chew the coca, which gives them a similar thing to nitric oxide. But Tibetans somehow don't have any coca. So, okay, so, so that's the context. And that's what we're doing. Then we were given this place, uh, Tibet House was, as part of our cultural preservation mission, because we were saying, and which we are hoping still, to make Tibetan medicine, which is like a... Um, it's kind of a system that connects to the acupuncture tradition and the herbal tradition of China and the Ayurvedic tradition of India and also ancient Persian, Greek medicine and Mongolia and Tibetan's own uh, native medicine. And it's a very fascinating among the sort of organic, holistic, uh, tradition, Asian traditions. Um, and and um, I had the kind of insight that if the Western world got to know the, the beauties and interests of Tibetan medicine, uh, that it would become a great industry for the Tibetans. And the Dalai Lama said, whenever Tibet is either autonomous, in other words, fact, actually free, even though maybe a province of, a sort of remote province of China, or totally free if China keeps screwing up and falls apart, um, either one, uh, that he wanted Tibet to be like the Switzerland of Asia, with the herbal medicine, sanatoria, people going there from the overcrowded and polluted cities of great Asia, you know, up there for, to, for health and so forth. And uh, like Switzerland in Europe, in a neutral place, you know, a place where people would meet. That's what he wants it to be. And, uh, and so the, we, we were given this place. And uh, um, we were unfortunately not given any big money with it. We were just given the whole thing lock, stock and barrel. And um, we had to start trying to do it with our small institution in a nonprofit institution, which is not heavily funded either. And in the Tibet world, the, the cultural preservation, although the Dalai Lama has kept us in existence, um, the other Tibetan organizations, like the ones who do political lobbying in Washington, all the religious organizations, and um, even the one that raises money to help refugees in India and Nepal and a little bit in Tibet, they can't really operate in Tibet because of the Chinese, but they still do send occasionally food or yaks or something, money to buy yaks. They somehow filter it through where Chinese don't resent it. Uh, and they all want all the money from all the Tibet supporting communities. So they're very competitive with us and we've only somehow managed by, you know, working and doing projects and doing things, art exhibitions, whatever it is, you know. So we thought that this would serve a double purpose, and Nina has worked here with no pay. I don't get paid also by Tibet House. It's my love job, my voluntary job. I get paid by Columbia University. And um, I get on a rare when I give lectures, but I, otherwise I'm not paid a salary to, be, to run it and fundraise for it. And um, so we, this is our plan is that this becomes a thriving place. And as we get more strong and have more cash flow, which we still haven't after 12 years, 
13, 14 years. But we have some, you know, we could have more Tibetan doctors here and they could get more known, they could start, they could start shifting a little more from sort of yoga and com sort of small scale competing with, with Omega and Kripalu in these much bigger, much bigger places that, you know, that, uh, that we can't really compete with. But shift more to the health thing, which, uh, which will give us a better economic model and that's sort of our plan. And, and then in the health thing we build in more Asian medicine stuff and more meditative stuff. We don't mind body things where, you know, if you're not depressed and pissed off all the time, then you might be more healthy. <laughs> Which people have been discovering, and the uh, Lama has been pushing very much the neuroscientists and the, all these kind of studies about the value of mindfulness meditation, and they haven't really, and a little bit compassion meditation, and you know, cortisol versus uh, oxycontin, not oxycontin, what's the other one? Oxy, the one that, you're the peaceful one. Oxytocin. What? Oxytocin. Oxytocin, thank you. Yeah, oxytocin is not going to. <laughs> no, that doesn't help because you sink into your own despair. Maybe, 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 that's, that's a good background, but maybe you should now yeah. go into some. So, anyway, so that's what this is about. So, then within that context, uh, we have the idea that the community that lives here and works here and does things, and then even maybe the summer people get to enjoy being here, but we've just been so busy and so strung out. We haven't really, for example, we, we, you know, interns, when, when the summer comes, we have lots of interns, right? That we would have like a class for them, you know, but then who's going to teach that? Mike is going to teach that, oh, right? God. Yes, <laughs> definitely. But no, it kind of falls on me at the moment, although I'm nearly croaking my voice is steam. I fell on the ice the other day and I, I, my back was cracked, my rib was cracked. I'm barely making it. So, but the idea is that the, we would develop years. a kind of mm, esprit de corps, let's say. Which doesn't mean at all that people have to be Buddhist in any way, shape, or form. The Dalai Lama has been scrupulous in Western countries never to convert people to Buddhism who are not Buddhist because he doesn't want Christians and Muslims converting Buddhists to them either. He thinks that religions should not compete for market share in the current world pluralism climate with the, you know, with ISIS, with the weapons, with the crusades, you know. It's too dangerous, you know. And even some Buddhists, like in Burma and Sri Lanka, they were very nasty to Hindus and, and Muslims. The Sri Lankans were to the Hindu Tamils. And um, right now in Burma, they're being very, very bad to a certain group of Muslims in the, up, near Bangladesh, up near Bangladesh side. The, um, uh, whatever it's called. And um, so, so he's very scrupulous about that, and we are totally in agreement with that. But the Buddhist mind science and the Buddhist... Um, sort of worldview is very useful and sh we hope it to be sort of composite and, and uh, uh, you know, causal in creating this esprit de corps. And that's what we sort of do teach other people when they come here. We know a lot of things relate a little bit to that, although we also like Native American stuff, we like shamanistic stuff, Taoist, whatever it is, Hindu, it's all fine. It's all, because all of that, especially in Asia, was already touched by Buddhism in a non- converting non-missionary sort of way. But the Buddhist psychology, meditative phenomenology, skill of uh, herbal skill, skill of medicine is like that. Uh, it, it was, was very contributive to the, all those civilizations in Asia and even in per Iran and even the West actually. Uh, uh, St. Augustine, for people who don't know that, but he was a Manichae in his youth and before, you know, before he decided it was a big heresy or something. And Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, Manichaeism form of Christianity, considered Buddha one of his backers, you know, one of his lineage, you know, like, uh, like Christ and Buddha were in one sort of, you know, like Christ and Moses, you know, in the West people might think, and Isaiah and St. John the Baptist, you, they sort of have a lineage, and uh, Mani had Buddha in that lineage. So there was this, through Persia, there was this connection, quite a big connection. So, so that's what we're doing. Okay, so now what I was supposed to do today, under, under, higher authority, was talk about said two things. One, what is Buddhism? And two, then the, especially the emphasis on altruism and compassion and uh, wisdom and compassion, you know, those sort of central things. And there, you know, the, the Dalai Lama, there's a very funny story about the Dalai Lama that we were just working on today, actually, Mike and I, because we were doing this graphic novel, 252 pages, almost finished now, 
on the you life of the Dalai Lama. saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Five years now. Yeah, no, it's almost done. I've been hearing that for two years. Almost finished. No, I haven't been saying that for two years. But it's really close to done. Our donors gave money for it and so forth. And uh, the, the, the Dalai Lama shocked everybody in the early 60s when he came out and was in India. At one point he saw this teacher who was known to have a special teaching about compassion. From Shanti Deva, there's a considered like a special lineage, like the atmosphere is called the, the precept of the exchange of self and other. Mm -hmm. And it's like where it's like a sort of way of cultivating uh, the, the old English proverb, like put yourself in the other fellow's shoes, you know that idea? Where you sort of see a situation from another's point of view. But this is kind of like an ur source of that teaching, you know. And, there, and it's considered this one guy who was a, a very eccentric guy from India, he was an Indian citizen actually, but from ethnic Himalayas, Tibetan Himalayas, so he was Tibetan uh, culturally. Uh, uh, he was known to be the one carrying that alive, so to speak. So when the Dalai Lama saw him in the street, in one of those car flotillas that they have, you know, where a bunch of police cars and jeeps and things, very humble cars in those days, were going along with the Indian government giving him security. And he said, oh, there's Kuno Lama Rinpoche, he said. And he stopped the thing, you know, and he made everybody stop. And he jumped out of the car, ran and started bowing in the dusty street to this guy called Kuno Lama Rinpoche, saying, you have to give me the special teaching, the personal precept from this Nyingma teacher from, uh, from Eastern Tibet, Patra Rinpoche. Oh. I need that to, I well, I want to strengthen my compassion and I need that teaching. And then the Kuno Lama, who was very shy and intimidated about the Dalai Lama, you know, because he had only been, you know, <coughs> seen him far away up in the palace in Tibet type of thing. He said, oh no, I wouldn't dare teach the Dalai Lama, and he ran away. So then the Dalai Lama got the, the, the flotilla to follow him home, and they all walked up, five-story walk up into his room, where he had no furniture, he was sitting there hiding. And they pounded off the door, went in and said, no, I got to have the teaching. And this was the famous teaching of what is called universal responsibility, how we're all responsible for each other. Everyone is responsible for everything. You know, it's, it's a special kind of, which relates to the idea that one is interconnected with all beings and that one's own happiness depends on their happiness, therefore, actually. You know, it's like, and we've only caught up to that in our culture since the 60s where we have the concept of vibrations. <laughs> you know, you're feeling all cheery, and then you go in a, in, a, in a place with all your friends and everything, and there's a lot of bad vibes. People have just had a big fight or argument. And then suddenly you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then you're in a good mood. And then, or sometimes you're in the dumps and feeling kind of depressed and don't even want to see anybody, but you have to go, have to go through a room where a bunch of people are because you have to take a pee or something, although you don't want to look at them. <laughs> but then they're all having a fun time, and they're, te they're teasing you and cheering you up. And then suddenly your vibe goes up, you see. So that, they, they make that into a thing where... Therefore, as the Dalai Lama likes to say, he says, okay, if you want to be selfish successfully, meaning you want to be happy yourself, be a wise selfish. He has this famous expression he makes, like ungrammatical. So if you want to be, succeed in being selfish, be a wise selfish. And if you want to be happy, make other people happy. He, has, he, he does it like that. And it's very famous when he really gives that teaching strongly, or some nowadays there are some people who are really received from him that teaching. When people listen to it, they get a kind of like, which person in the audience am I? They really do begin to feel empathetic with the people in the around them. It has it's that's the thing about the personal precept that does that. So we were just doing that where he received that, right? It was that you're gonna love it, that chapter. Anyway. So that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of thing here. Now, what is Buddhism? Okay, what is Buddhism? When finally, after 50 years of studying and teaching Buddhism, uh, I, my, my slogan, my you know, epitome, pithiest possible statement is that Buddhism is engaged realism. That's what it is. It's not really a religion of, I believe in Buddha. Some people do, and some people take it like that, where under the modern definition of religion, which means believing something, you know, believing in something. You know, and actually, of course, the worst kind is blind believing, but there's no reason to. And there I, did, did I tell you the joke about the preacher and the little boy? Did I tell you that joke? 
Well, that's a joke that um, some theologians in Chicago told. <laughs> where, where nobody relates to this. Because they want to say, this is not what Buddhism is. So this preacher, this, this fundamentalist preacher, was talking to the audience out in the Middle West, you know, and he was saying, well now, y'all good people, you love Christ, but I want to know, if some, I want someone to tell me, do you know what faith is? What is faith? Tell me. Silence. You know, you know, they're all scared of this preacher. He said, come on now, you tell me, what is faith? Silence. And then there's a little boy in the front row, and his hand is like this, practically breaks his shoulder. And then he says again to the people, he says, now, folks, you're all grown up. You've been studying Bible for a long time, and here the only little John is holding up his hand. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? And still silence. So finally he says, okay, little Johnny, you know what faith is? He says, yes, I do, preacher, I do. Can you tell these good people what faith is? Says, yes, I can, preacher. Okay, what is faith, Johnny? He says, faith is believing what you know ain't true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I told you about a famous Christian theologian <laughs> in Chicago after a few drinks. So, so uh, back to Kunalama. Yeah, Kunalama. No, no. What's Buddhism? Yeah. So I'm saying engage Buddha's discovery. That's engaged Buddhism right there. Buddha's yeah. discovery. What happened? Oh no. No, no. Someone's no, asking don't, for help. Can't leave at the moment. Just don't worry. So. No, you can answer the question. Go for it, John. So, your job. So, so, uh, so, uh, yeah. So, Buddha's discovery, you know, this so called enlightenment, was not, you know, God. It was not that he's supposed to believe in somebody who can do it for you, that, you know, someone else will help you become happy and free you from suffering. His discovery was. The nature of reality is the claim. Although he was then quick to say, you don't have to believe that's true. I'm not asking that you believe me. But you should, But now I'm having discovered this and being very happy by having discovered it, I think you'll be happier if you work towards that. And if you try any of the little things I suggest and you feel better, and you, then you start giving me a little credibility. But you don't have to believe that I understand reality, although I do. So it's, it's a nice paradoxical thing the way he told it. So, the, and he, the reality that he discovered was that everything is fine, that ultimately the world is good, it's not, hell is not waiting, there is, we can make hell out of it, of our, our close thing, we can make a hellish situation, but it's not the reality of it. The, the suffering part comes from not understanding that reality. So, the old slogan, you know, ignorance is bliss, and you don't want to know that much about reality, is reversed, in other words. Ignorance leads to suffering, and is the cause of suffering, not evil, but ignorance. And, and, um, and reality actually is bliss. And the way he taught that initially to his first five students, after he understood that, was called the Four Noble Truths. And they're called Noble Truths, they could also be called Noble Facts, if you go on the sort of realism side of it, because truth means sounds like something you're supposed to believe, but these are called Four Noble Facts, and they're Noble Facts because they're only facts for a noble person. And a noble person, he defined, he redefined the word noble, which was a class term in his era, like the word like a noble, you know, like a baron or something. But he redefined it to mean not a baron or a social status, but someone who has a higher degree of understanding of reality and therefore experiences other people as equal in importance and value to themselves. The ignorant person thinks of themselves as the most important thing, in any situation, although they can still be nice, they can control their you know, worst habits and so forth, but they, but they still perceive themselves, experience themselves as the center of everything. And then the ones who go really selfish, of course, then we call them selfish. But the, if this is the, so when you say self-centered, it's like a more of an epistemological or a psychological description rather than a moralistic thing. And that's the ordinary person, or what he called the ordinary separated individual, or the alienated individual who somehow feels estranged from others and the world, because they're the main thing. Whereas a noble person has had a, a different experience, where they then have come to see others as of equal value as themselves, and then there are a lot more others, and so therefore uh, they become natural, not, you know, experientially altruistic, rather than morally following a moral principle against some sort of innate inclination, if you follow. So that's why they're called noble facts, because they're not facts for the ordinary person who's just mainly out there for themselves. 
So, uh, human beings, of course, the Buddha was very happy about human beings in the sense that the human, among the animal life forms, is the most imaginative and therefore the most capable of identifying with others. First of all, the human is a mammal, they have their young in the belly of the female for a long time, then the, the young one is weak for many years, and it depends on the kindness of strangers at first who then become family members. And uh, so the human is a very 